In the final week of the course, we want to try to address some possibilities for effectively addressing the challenge of feeding a growing number of people with potentially diminishing resources under climate change. And particularly, try to look at innovations which may help people in some of the less developed regions of the world. These are regions where there are already very large numbers of hungry people and relatively few resources to apply to this set of problems. So we're very fortunate today to be able to talk to Tim Clark, who's had a very varied career. Most recently, perhaps, and relevant to our discussions today, he's been EU ambassador to both Ethiopia and Tanzania. He has a real interest in environmental issues and in food security. So Tim, could you tell us a little bit about your interests, your, your background, and particularly um, your work with the EU uh, in, in different parts of the world? I've lived 12 years of my life in Africa. And um, during that time, apart from my love of the, of the environment, you can't help feeling the huge problems associated with a billion people living on a continent, many of whom are in very in desperate poverty, despite many efforts made by governments, the, the rural poor in particular in most of the country is up to 80% of the population live in the rural areas. And most of those people are involved in one way or another in food security for themselves and for gaining their livelihoods. So I became very interested in the whole issue of food security. And my first job, in fact, was in Tanzania in 1986 as a rural development advisor. And I was given responsibility for managing a lot of money, over 100 million euros at that wow. time, accus at the time in trying to support the agricultural sector. And we found it very, very difficult, even with massive sums of money. Somehow we, we found it a real challenge to get the right answers, how to promote agriculture in these areas. And my final moment, uh, my final reflection, and what I've called my Martin Luther King moment, my dream, is um, to try and find a way of genuinely motivating uh, rural peoples in Africa so that they can have a mastery of their own environment, they can live with dignity and prosperity. And the key is to provide them with the tools and the knowledge to exploit their environment in a sustainable way, with them running their own resources, having responsibility for seeing that change. And what we came up with was the idea of an eco-village where a community takes real control of its own destiny, its own development, and manages in a holistic way, a sustainable way, water, energy, and the natural resources which that community depends on for its livelihoods, mm -hmm. soils. And um, in 2011, we signed off on three what we called eco-villages in Tanzania, funded through a climate change adaptation budget line from the European Union. And one of the villages we chose, the village which was the most poor in the whole country, the most vulnerable, living in the most fragile environment. It's a village called Chololo. And we said, if we can get it right here, we can get it right everywhere. And six different institutions all came together. And they said, look, to address a holistic mm. problem, we need holistic solutions. So institutions with different competencies and skills came together for the first time. So they were local All of them were local. In this wow. particular case of Chilolo, there were six local institutions. One dealing with um, rural development training and extension work. One dealing with um, trying to identify new crops that would work in a very arid area. One dealing with innovation, interestingly. Uh, <laughs> one dealing with organic farming methods. And there were the six of these different that formed a consortium and uh, said, look, let's try and all work together for the first time. And a sort of miracle happened. <laughs> uh, this particular community is in a 
highly arid and very fragile area. Within two years, the crops, uh, the production of the crops multiplied by a factor of three. And communities that used to live off handouts from, amongst others, the European Union, managed their own resources and could live with dignity and with respect. And they were creating work for people, they were creating opportunities, and even small-scale industries. In two years, I've never seen this before <laughs> in any, any program I've been involved in before. And uh, it's obviously made some impact because now new resources are being mobilised and we're hoping that we can repeat this. People will look at this concept and try to take it on a wider basis throughout Tanzania and elsewhere. Okay. Okay. Can you give us some examples of some of, some of the technologies which, which you felt were particularly effective? Well, in this uh, particular program, there are two things. One is in relation to solar power. So water used to be provided through um, a pumping system, which was, came from a diesel um, engine, an old Lister diesel. <laughs> I mean, it must be 40, 50 years old and still working, but it was costing money. They replaced it with a simple solar panel and bingo, um, they got it for free. The person marketing the diesel wasn't too happy about that and that was a bit of a struggle. But with a relatively cheap new technology, energy provided came, came free from the sun. The second innovation was to try to um, address a problem which has grown worse over a period of time. Uh, women in this particular village, like most villages in, in Africa, have to walk a long way to get uh, firewood. And in this case, they needed to go six hours twice a week to get fuel. And the project looked at this issue and found that by a relatively cheap and uh, simple change to the way they burnt wood, they could reduce the numbers of uh, trips to collect wood by a half. And that's within two years. So instead of two bundles of wood per week. For household, it was down to one bundle for exactly the same product. And now they were still working further to reduce it even more. And that frees up time for the woman to do other things. Also, at the same time, they introduced a very simple technological change so that smoke doesn't irritate the eyes and, and, and cause all sorts of problems. And there's a third technique as well, which is interesting, a biogas production, so improved livestock have been uh, purchased within the program and there's some enterprising farmers that are producing fuel for lighting, which is desperate for education of their children, um, and, but also for fuel for domestic consumption in, to replace completely the requirement for wood fuel. So, I mean, it's a total win-win. <laughs> solution. Um, better use of the natural resources, so you solve food security issues, you solve conservation issues, you give wealth and prosperity and dignity to rural people, you create new markets, new opportunities. But for me what was perhaps the biggest and most exciting change was a community that had been dependent totally on others, that had been left to its own devices and was in misery and poverty. Because of this intervention, a wise use of technology addressing their needs, they had completely changed their own spirit of the community as a, as a community, as individuals. They could actually make a difference to their own lives. And this was infectious. In a, in a very local restricted area, they are solving their own food security problems, but they're also solving the food security problems for others. Mm. And imagine with low cost, if this type of development could be replicated across Africa and elsewhere, where a billion mouths to feed. Yeah. I mean, I'm struck listening to you talking about the, the innovation, the innovations that were particularly effective, that actually they're, they're not a million miles from the innovations which many farmers in the UK Absolutely. are, are employing. I mean, um, the generation of um, gas from digesters it proves, proves to be in a f very effective way for um, farmers to diversify their, their activity here, and we've seen some very, very good examples of that. What, 
I mean, what are the limitations to, to rolling this out? I mean, is it realistic to expect that, it, that this level of investment is possible or is it possible to cause some of this change to occur with, with a reduced level of investment? Well, I think you raised two points. One is that what I've witnessed in Africa actually mimics a lot of what's happening in Europe. And what I would really like to see is more synergies and exchange of information, knowledge, technology, research-led development, which I believe is absolutely essential to change the, make it a game changer for, mm. for African agriculture. And I have to say Lancaster is doing a great effort, great contribution to that through its food security program, but also through the Lancaster Environment Centre where they're an eco-innovation centre which is working here, brings together the private sector, the public sector, research, all focused on trying to find solutions to problems. In terms of resources, the second issue, I personally don't think resources is a, I mean, a lack of resources. It's the, it's the right resources in the right places. My sense is with relatively simple technologies and rather simple financing systems, um, the sort of developments we've seen in parts of Tanzania can be replicated and scaled up. It requires political will because, again, in many countries in, in Africa, you have a choice between the intensive farming route, which often leaves the smallholders on one side watching what's going on and still destitute, or the modification to the small-scale farming route which is much more intensive and complicated, involving community participation. But I would argue you, can, you, have a, you should have a mix between the two. And if you choose to go the intensive farming route, which I can understand for all sorts of reasons may be a good and wise choice, don't forget the smallholder farmer and set up sustainable systems which will ensure their families are not bystanders but actually are part of the process and can benefit as well. And I think that um, innovation at the end of the day is going to be the answer to all our ills, but innovation in a clever way. Mm -hmm. And my personal experience um, working for example on coffee and tea production, again both in Tanzania and Ethiopia, is that if you use the results from research in a sensible way and you link them directly to some sort of extension system with the farmers, you will get take up and you'll get better productivity and better yields and better money at the end of the day in the hands of the farmers. Remember, the key player at the end of the day is the farmer. I spend a lot of time speaking to African farmers. Even though they can be uneducated uh, in, in a sort of Western sense, they are absolutely interested in taking hold of new initiatives and developments. I remember one case from a Western Tanzania as a, a woman who was, became a genius <laughs> at taking new ideas, new varieties of coffee seedlings, trying them out in her own backyard, more or less, becoming a master at, at this. And she became the agent of change for all the coffee farmers around. And she acquired a sort of an incredible status because she was someone who understood that by playing around with these things in a sensible way and using her own skills as a communicator, she had a sort of ripple effect on everyone. And she was completely uneducated in a formal sense, but she was just very interested in playing around with with uh, seed varieties and so on in her own experience. So I'm sure you, know, you can find lots and lots of people like that. Um, and they stand out in a crowd and whether you're in Europe or Asia or Africa, these are the people that will lead the change process. So the technique is to find these people that make them the drivers of change. Yeah.